current role, I work as a communications advisor uh, at the CSIRO in the Data61 unit. And basically what I do is a combination of writing communications materials and advising on directions to take around communications. And that relates to cognitive science mostly through my own experience in how psychology and cognition function uh, in the context of words that are said and transferred through digital means. Uh, there are different ways that you can communicate issues that are relating to science and technology. You can take a very direct approach, you can state the facts, you can tell them what's happening, or you can take more of a narrative approach and tell them a bit of a story. And both of those approaches are appropriate in different circumstances. Cognitive science and psychology have also taught me how to understand audiences and the different places that people are coming from. Another way that cognitive science and psychology relate to my current role is that I learned useful tools for understanding how people en masse will react to technologies and concepts and ideas that we put out into the world. This is a really important part of responsibly developing these things and it's also a really important part of making sure that you manage issues before they happen and it's a really valuable thing for a lot of private corporations, government organizations these days who are, who are dealing with really new and unique things in society. So I left school in 2003 and I I guess I was a little bit directionless after, after high school. All of my subjects that I did in high school were, were very science-based. I was also particularly good at English and communications, but I didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to do. I kind of vaguely aspired to be a science communicator, but I went to university and the first subject that I signed up for was, I think, immunization and microbiology. Uh, I realized probably after about a month that, uh, first of all, I had absolutely no skill in those fields. And secondly, they were very hard and I had trouble paying attention to them. In my second year of university, I flicked over to neuroscience and psychology as my majors. And as part of my science degree, what I found was my marks started improving quite significantly. I was intrinsically motivated about what I was doing. I found it really, really interesting. But also I was discovering things that I could start relating immediately to my everyday life. And I could also start relating those things back to my fascination with big scientific issues. So when I was quite young, I started reading Richard Dawkins, I started reading a bit of Carl Sagan um, and learning about the wonder of science, but also about the ways that science can go wrong in some ways. So, that, so when people start subscribing to pseudoscientific ideas and when people start attacking science directly, these were all really interesting to me. So when I started learning, I guess, the science of how we perceive science, I started understanding different things that I'd heard about before but all of a sudden they started falling into place and the really interesting thing was how that changed the way I, I interacted with academia. I started being really keen to learn, I started being really keen to dedicate my own personal time to academic effort and that really changed me a lot. I started reading more widely, I started engaging with lecturers uh, and yeah my marks improved quite a lot in my third year as soon as I started getting really into cognitive science, and neuroscience and psychology. Yeah, so I graduated university and I, I kind of fell into a weird lull again. And it was because I was a little bit baffled. I knew, I understood that the academic endeavor was exciting, thrilling and fascinating, but I was completely at a loss for what job I should be doing. And so I ended up in a call center for about a year uh, dealing with complaints about housing. Uh, that was not particularly invigorating I spent most of that job writing comedy blog posts on Facebook. Uh, so I wasn't really learning very much. I wasn't engaging with science the way that I was. And eventually I got tired of it. I quit and I started applying for jobs that had the word science and engineering in them. Uh, I, this was actually fairly directionless. I really just wanted a job that had something to do with science. And then I thought I'll deal with it. I'll work my way up. I'll think about it once I have the job. And I found a job that was at a renewable energy company. And what they were doing was setting up a monitoring center for wind farms. So it was a data analytics job. And I had some data anal analysis skills and I had some communication skills and I had some basic understanding of science. And happily they hired me. So I started setting up this monitoring center for a bunch of new wind farms. And getting that job coincided with a really, really important time in Australian society, which was when we started politically and socially trying to grapple with the concept 
of decarbonization through the use of machines. So specifically wind turbines and solar panels. These became really, really big political and social issues in the year 2010, which is the year that I started at this company. And also was part of the reason that I was, that I was hired is that uh, the policy environment at the time was perfect for renewable energy companies starting to expand. So they were hiring new people, they were setting up operations and control centers to, in expectation of expanding their fleet massively. Uh, so one thing I found very quickly was that not everybody liked the machines that we were making. And this was not part of my job. My job was to monitor the machines, was to analyze the data that was collected from them, was to do some financial analysis on how they were operating and the best times to operate. But I absolutely could not help but be drawn to issues around public reactions to the machines that we were building, both politically and from a community perspective. So I was doing shift work. I was starting at 7 p.m. and I was finishing at 7 a.m. It was pretty harrowing sometimes. But what I found is that one thing that I could do during the shift in the late hours of the night, once I'd done all the stuff that I needed to do, was write. And what else to write about, but the issues that were at the absolute fore of the technology I was dealing with every day. So I started blogging for the first time in 2012. And what I found was that the audience for this was massive. And specifically what I was blogging about was the reasons the people were reacting to, to the technology the way they were. So I was interested in the psychology and I was interested in the cognitive biases that led them to grapple with and eventually accept the beliefs that they were stating. And there was one specific one, which was the belief that wind turbines were causing health issues in individuals. This was really interesting to me because the classic framing that you would see in the media was a bunch of people who aren't very smart have silly beliefs. That kept coming up again and again, and something didn't feel right about it. And it wasn't that their belief was scientifically justified. The situation hasn't really changed since then. It still isn't scientifically justified. But the sentiment that drove them to accept those beliefs was driven by something very specific and something that had been understood in previous psychological literature. So that was my journey through this starting out in the renewable energy industry. I started grappling with those issues. I started publishing some research on that in my spare time. Eventually I was writing so much about it that I got moved into communications to start talking about this publicly. And that was really, really great. I got to, on my own terms, I got to understand those issues and start liaising with other researchers. Even though I worked for the company that was developing these machines at the time, I got to really uh, have some space to understand the academic side of it. And since then I've moved through different parts of the renewable energy industry. I've worked for government as a communicator for renewables. And since then I've left the renewables industry and now I work in the data and startup sector, dealing with really similar issues, but on a different scale. One interesting thing about the start of my career was that I actually didn't start out with a deep love of climate action and renewable energy. I actually started out with a deep love of science and technology. And what I saw in that job was the application of the things that I love to the real world. And of course, through that experience, I discovered all the little nooks and crannies where cognitive science and psychology were the answers to a lot of questions that were buzzing around, but no one had really thought about it in the context of those fields of scientific inquiry. I think one of the biggest changes that we're gonna see, thanks to the work of cognitive science, is hopefully a better understanding of why people react to new things the way they do and this will hopefully engender slightly more empathy and slightly more expectation when people are developing new things to release into the world. So technologies, ideas, software, applications, all of those things, when you start introducing them to communities and to individuals, you need to have a bit of an understanding of how the human mind works. And I don't mean that in a condescending way, I mean that in a really specific and very respectful way. So. You have to understand the things that we fear, the things that we love, the things that we loathe, and the habits that we have when it comes to both understanding and misunderstanding new things that we experience. Hopefully that changes the way that people engage with new technologies. And of course, hopefully that, that then leads to technology becoming a more useful and more sustainable part of our lives in the future. I think a really interesting example of an area where I think better use of cognitive science and psychology and understanding human beings could be the expansion of social media in our lives. So 
part of the way social media works is that it collects data about us, the things that we like, the things that we love, the things that we loathe, and it uses that data to serve advertising to us. Now, we don't have a particularly great understanding of how that's working, and that really involves a loss of control and a loss of awareness on the part of the user. And a very predictable response to that is anger, is anger and really strong sentiment. And following on from that, anger and strong sentiment often lead to the take up of beliefs that aren't supported by evidence. Now, this is an area that you can understand and preempt before it happens. Making sure that users are fully involved, making sure that they're aware of transparent information about the technology that they're using can actually avoid people getting angry. This is a really a big issue around community engagement for new technology being used as part of making social media profitable. This is a really good example of making cognitive science and psychology work to the betterment of relationships between technology and the people using the technology. I work in communications. So obviously having really good writing skills and being very clear about everything that you say is really important. But I think that the, that collection of skills is starting to shift a little bit. Having the ability to express yourself in person when you're speaking is really important too. But there's also a third thing, it's, it's being open to new technologies and new ideas when it comes to writing and putting communications out into the world. And part of this is because the types of media that we're using to communicate on mass to people is changing very rapidly. So sometimes you're communicating in a short video, other times you're writing a 2000 word article, uh, other times you're literally just creating an image uh, with maybe a couple of hashtags on it. So this is all within a day and you have to be able to switch between those skills really quickly. Uh, at the core of all of it is a deep and passionate understanding of the work that you're doing and hopefully, in most instances, a bit of a love or a bit of an excitement about the thing it is that you're communicating, that always helps quite a lot. I have two pieces of advice. My first piece of advice is make sure that when you hear an idea or a way of working or a concept that you immediately react to and it sounds weird and stupid, pause for a second and charitably listen to them explain what it is that they're suggesting to you. You will probably learn new things. You're probably smart enough if they have a bad idea to reject it, but chances are you'll probably learn some interesting new ways of dealing with the world. My second piece of advice is when you start writing, you're gonna be pretty crap at it. I was pretty crap at it when I started, but if you keep going and if you do it on something that you're passionate and interested in, you will eventually become very, very good at it and it's just gonna happen over a period of time. When that happens, you will have a really important skill and it's gonna be super useful but at the start, it's gonna feel weird. So just write, it feels great.